Hi, and welcome to the second episode of Beyond the Talk, where we're delving deeper into conversations that were started at Elevate. Uh, so whether we're talking about championing inclusivity or the challenges around recruitment and retention, we know it's important to keep those discussions going if we're to affect change and, and drive the sector forward. Um, at Elevate, we talked about what leadership in health, fitness and physical activity looks like. And I'm pleased to be joined today by some amazing guests to continue those discussions. Uh, so I'm Elaine Briggs. I'm Chief Education Partnerships Officer at FutureFit Group. And I would like to introduce firstly, Stuart. Hello, everyone. My name is Stuart Liversedge. I am a business development manager for Active IQ. Uh, we are an awarding organisation in the health, fitness and wellness sector. Thank you. John? And I'm John Oxley. I'm chief executive of Life Leisure here in um, Stockport. Um, and I also um, authored the uh, Transformational Leadership um, Programme, which to much greater claim. And last, but of course not least. Uh, hi, I'm Andy King. Uh, I'm now director of Miuva. Uh, change consultancy and still chair of GM Active. Thank you very much. So I think we're ready for some lively discussion. Uh, I'm going to start with a Marmite question, love it or hate it. Um, the pivot to active well-being. What does it mean? What's it about? Um, and what can we do as a sector to be part of it? And I think I might start with John because he's got some very strong views on the subject. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the pivot has become a bit of a colloquial term, hasn't it? And um, and I think really what it what it really means is we have a in the in the public sector leisure service, traditional provision of swimming pools and sports halls and gyms and dance studios and outdoor pitches and those sorts of things um, is really understanding why they're there and who are they there for and what do they do for a neighborhood and a, and a community. And I think that we've, we've got a, a situation um, as a consequence of austerity and then as a consequence of um, the pandemic and as a consequence of the um, energy crisis, um, local governments are, um, funding being seriously depleted and services like sport and physical activity being under pressure to, to survive. Um, and that in order to survive, you have to redefine, I think, what, we, what we're trying to do is redefine exactly why we exist. Um, and we exist really to become a preventative health service rather than a optional leisure service. That to me is what Pivot's about. Thanks very much, Andy. Yes, yeah, yeah, from my point of view, um, funnily enough, we, we agree. I think the term Pivot, as there's been some talk recently about um, I think basically the argument is that we're not pivoting from something to something because we've always done good stuff related to, to health and uh, in, in, in effect population health. Um, I don't think anybody's going to deny that. And certainly, you know, we champion what the good stuff that does go on in, in, the, in the sector. But we're, I think we're quite internal uh, focused. And I think the evidence suggests that the government and others don't actually see us as a, as a part of the health solution if you like and um, there's too many instances where we're just overlooked there's another one today for instance about diabetes uh, about certain checks and diabetes could could help um reduce the the risk of people um uh, having uh, type 2 diabetes so th there's a whole long list of evidence that says we're not taken seriously in that 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 regard so our proposition isn't strong although we might like to think it is and we can all share some good examples of where that sort of work does take place but it's not at scale and it's not um, accustomed to the government to actually say, no, actually, we've got a problem in population health. Let's go and talk to those guys, that sector, who can be part of the solution. We are overlooked. So we all feel that the pivot is that saying that our pivot is a mindset from ourselves and from the government and others, uh, local at regional level government, to actually say we are part of the solution. We want to be part of that solution. And we need to make that very, very clear in, in numerous ways. Thank you. I mean, it is gathering uh, momentum, isn't it? You know, think about Elevate and other um, events we've had recently. Everybody's talking about the pivot. Do you think our sector really sort of understands what that is, what's involved, how they're going to have to come together and collaborate in order to make it happen? Or, 
you know, I remember from years ago, we, we've always talked about the fact that we need to be taken more seriously and be more seen as professionals. And if we were to work with the health sector and the care sector um, and for them to think of us, then we, we, need to, we need to change. But we've been talking about that for a very long time now. And I just wonder what's different now? Do you feel there is something different? Do you feel that that we have got this collaboration, that, that we are going to actually start and make a difference now? Are you seeing that in, in the world and the, the people that you're talking to? I, I think that there is, a, there is a change and there has to be a change. I think you're, you're right. We've been talking about the same things for quite a long time. Um, I remember going to a, a summit back in 2017, Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of the um, Health Service, you know, presented to the physical activity section. Why have you thought, oh, wow, this is this is change. I think our, our, our issue is that we have got to be, whenever you, you have a change, you've got to be prepared to view things from other people's perspectives. Mm. If we're going to be, if we're going to, have a contributory role to be to play as part of the system approach to improving population health and addressing health inequality then we have to be prepared to understand those terms and what they really really mean we have to be able to understand the language that others are speaking um, and we have to show some humility in 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 moving away from our own entrenched and perhaps isolated position and going to meet others and being prepared to say we'd like to know more we'd like to understand more we'd like to understand how we might play a role that might support you and i think we've not had that that's when andy talks about this sort of pivot in mindset i think that the reason that we've we've not been successful over those years is that we've not had that mindset which is more collaborative, demonstrates humility, a desire to join up and collaborate with others. And I think that's what's required now. And I do sense it's, we're getting, we're getting there. Well, that's positive. That's a positive thing. I mean, Stuart, I'll bring you in here now because you've worked in the sector for, for quite a long time. Do you want to just give us a, a quick history of, of your background and, and how you've come to be where you are now? Because your role is, is really important as an awards and organisation. Um, we'll come on in a minute to talk about um, workforce and skills. And, you know, my belief is always that, you know, we, we can't expect to on a whether, you know, it, it's health inequalities that we're trying to tackle or whether we're trying to, um, you know, work towards the, the um, Unite the Movement strategy of Sport England, unless we have a highly skilled, professional, well-trained workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and the awards and organisations and the qualification makers um, are very important in that. But if you could just give us a bit of a background of, of you and, you know, your, your thoughts on where we're at now, because you've been in the sector a little while, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so yeah. you've, you've also sort of seen this kind of um, history of us talking about this, but but now we do, as John sort of says, we you know we do appear to be at the point where something's going to happen. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started back as a lifeguard in 1997, so 26 years I've been in fitness operations. Um, throughout my career, I was really lucky to work mostly within the private sector and, and kind of moved up through the different roles there. So. I've, kind of experienced it from a fitness manager point of view where you're more about interaction with the members and and looking after the health of those active people already to yeah. then moving into general management and uh, regional management where you're looking at growing the numbers of the club so actually you're trying to impact a higher population or percentage of the population of that town or or, or city yeah. um, so i think over over the years that i've been in the sector i definitely think we've moved away now from the traditional health and fitness being ultimately fitness. All of our qualifications, all of my vocational qualifications that I had all kind of centered around fitness operations, personal training, gym, spinning, et cetera, et cetera. And I think now where maybe pivot is a term that could be used is that we, as an education, we're pivoting from fitness into wellness. So it is, it is moving from one to the other, where we're now starting to say, well, actually fitness is, is is one area, wellness suddenly becomes a lot more broader. So we certainly as an awarding organization, we wanna be tapping into the import that these organizations are having. So we can look to design new qualifications, we can look to broaden the scope of the existing qualifications as well, so that we're not just pigeonholed by other, other areas within the UK. We're not just 
gym instructors or personal trainers. We're actually more than, to coin your phrase from the other day, we're more than a personal trainer because with the right education and the right support from the, you know, the, the bodies that be, we can design sleep awareness. We can design signposting courses so that fitness professionals, uh, which I'm proud to say I'm after my time, hopefully, is somebody that is aware of their, their swim lane and they, they can signpost onwards to then go out. Once we kind of tackle these, these educational areas and we give ourselves a, a better standing point to, to argue at, we can then build these relationships with the other, other departments and say, well, actually, we have got that skill set. And did you know we can do this? Did you know that um, we can refer off here and there's, there's different organisations that will work with leisure centres, local gyms as a, as a community hub? so that we can then direct people to the relevant services. And that, as always, is not just fitness, nutrition, sleep, well-being, smoking cessation, stress management, financial management. All of these areas will um, play a part in, into building somebody's perception of wellness. Thank you for that. So it's, it's not just about the, um, the, the qualifications and the skills and everything else, as you sort of say, and as John sort of touched on, it's actually about knowing the system and knowing the right terminology and speaking the right language and also you know the knowing the, the ecosystem really so the lo the local gp surgery and mm -hmm. and you know the smoking cessation services and all that kind of thing so i'll bring Andy back in here because this is really what we're terming as systems leadership isn't it and this is where we're really sort of trying to yeah. to to educate our sector in what is systems leadership which i'm hoping you can tell us <laughs> and why it's so important mm -hmm. uh, for our workforce yeah, absolutely. And I think just go back on, on the one of the earlier points that I think there is a lot of evidence that this is um, taking root really across the sector. If you look at some of the, the major players, their strategies recently released uh, are very clear that they, they see the value in this sort of pivot to active well-being, working with the sporting and type uniting the movement um, and, and all the rest of it. I think the risk on the, the systems leadership is that we try and do everything that we try and uh, train our staff to do absolutely everything that can be done. And I think John's point earlier was that we've got to uh, understand and with a degree of humility what our place is or could be in the system and then look at the what the training of our, our staff um, and ourselves, actually, uh, what we need to do um, across the board. So the systems leadership, if you like, is the qualities required to work in a collaboration across a system. So if you take a place, you know, the, the Sport England approach and others, you take a place and you say, okay, if we're going to try and improve population health, we just simply cannot do it on our own. If you take childhood obesity, we can't go in and go, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll get a load of kids on, a, I don't know, some membership or some program and we'll sort of solve. We know that doesn't happen. So why doesn't it happen? It's, it's what they term a complex problem. There are a number of factors at play here. And we've got to take a longer term view as well. So it's understanding the, the, the complexity of the issue that we're trying to address, um, our part in that. And then, as we say, you know, we've got to convene uh, people from the system to come together and understand, again, with leaving the badges at the door and all the other sort of cliches, about what can we all do here? What can we all bring to the party to have a system approach to reducing the likelihood of childhood obesity, uh, or if not eliminating it altogether, whatever it might be. And, and that's a totally different approach, which requires totally different skill sets. Um, so you might be the best level five, Jim Collins, good to great leader in your organization, uh, in the sector even. Um, but that's not gonna help you much in terms of understanding how you collaborate and work across the system. It's a different skill set. Mm. Um, and that was something we recognised a few years ago, and which sure we'll touch on. Where, you know, I made the call to John and said, "Look, we've got there's something in this systems leadership stuff, John, um, but we need to make it tangible and meaningful to our general managers and our staff in, yeah. in general." So, you know, the, we we sort of picked that button up a few years ago, and that's a. I'm sure we'll come on to that at some point. Yeah, no, as well, it's a good point to come on to now, actually, because um, we're talking about, you know, education, the workforce and, and leadership. So, yeah, if we go back a few years then, so this is, you know, post-pandemic and everyone talks about pivot and all that kind of thing, but there were, there were sort of more murmurings about this movement from fitness and facilities to health and communities and how we should be 
working more with communities. I guess, you know, the outside gyms were, were up and people were training online and, you know, even in care homes, you know, staff were, were putting on yeah. online exercise sessions and walking outside with a friend. And, mm-hmm. and it's hard to think of now to, to go back to that place. But so when you're only allowed one person, you bubble and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but we really did start to talk about that. And that was, I think, when... Again, you made the call to, to John and, and, and everyone started sort of saying, actually, yeah, this leadership thing, it's not management and line management, mm-hmm. as you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, it is leadership. What is it? What does it mean? Um, and so, John, you were sort of largely responsible, really, for kind of answering that question and saying, well, what do we need to train the workforce on? What what do they need to know that they don't already know as general managers or as, as, as you know leaders? What do we have to teach them? Because if the end goal is to get them to move towards a more kind of wellness, health, community based, mm. you know, tackling inequalities um, kind of arena, then then what do we need? So how did you sort of start that process? Did you did, did you already have some really strong opinions, I would imagine, maybe on the subject? And <laughs> oh, this is, this is your <laughs> outlet to be able to, to kind of uh, to get them out there. But you, you pulled together a really comprehensive leadership course that mm. has and is still, you know, continuing to to train many, many people and it's been very successful. So please tell us much more about it. Well, I think it's, um, without to be without trying to be too dismissive of it, I think this this realisation that leadership is different to management is, is crucial. And, um, and I suppose what you have to do as a leader is whatever you're leading, whether that be a small group of people or an, or an organisation or a, a, a borough or, or whatever, it, or the government, you have to understand the context yeah. and the landscape and the environment within which you're trying to do whatever it is that you're trying mm-hmm. to do. So all I try to do was apply good principles of leadership to um, to try to deal with what was a new a new problem and um, and that understanding of, of context and context and understanding of, of leadership I think is, is is really important so leadership is not about yourself as a leader leadership is about other people and then if you put that into the context of, of physical activity and well-being, well, what is our organisational purpose? Who's it for? Well, it's certainly not for the leader and it's not for the people that we're, we're working in our organisation. It's for the communities that we're actually serving. So try to understand. So most of what leadership is about is, is and, and it was what Andy said earlier was, was, um, was brilliant. Leadership is about being selfless. It's not about being selfish. Mm. And selfless means, you know, systems leadership is about being selfless. So as an example of systems leadership and understanding the, the, the context, say that at a local level, um, really understanding your neighbourhood, not presuming what that your sports hall needs to be used for sports. Understand what your neighbourhood needs. Now, we've got neighbourhoods here in Stockport who we've got people who need and we've developed this concept called confidence walks and we use our sports hall. Because they're not confident to walk outside. But we can provide them with confidence and provide a walking environment and provide them with physical activity and and social interaction and all of those sorts of things by using our sports hall. So that's one example of thinking about your landscape and your context and really trying to understand your neighbourhoods and your neighbourhoods' needs and using others, other agencies, I guess, in your neighbourhoods, it might be children's services or adult services or a, or age UK as, as you know in this case with with confidence walks, um, so that you can meet their need and that's leadership, understanding the context whether you're in and, and, and developing an offer that suits the suits the need. And there's ex- and another example of this sort of selflessness. Um, and uh, to to illustrate what systems leadership is, I went to a, a, a discussion at, here at the within the council around that was delivered by the director of education and the director of education was talking about educational um, attainment post 16. so i'm in that audience as chief executive of life leisure and because i now understand what it is that we're trying to do i'm saying i'm listening to his problems and challenges 
and his objectives, very dynamic, real aspiration about improving. And he's talking about, you know, general education attainment. Then he's talking about, yes, but let's look at those who are on free school meals and let's look at their education attainment. Mm. You know, let's, and, and I'm thinking then, okay, I'm privileged to lead an organization in Stockport that has got a, that, whose purpose is to improve the lives of others and is an important part of the preventative health service. What is it that I can do? How can I have an effect on those post-16 children, young people in Stockport, in order that, not that I meet my objectives, but I can help Tim meet his objectives and we have improved educational attainment for everybody. And how can I, how can I use physical activity to support in a systems-wide um, context, and then everybody wins. That's systems leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's that's a yeah. very sort of uh, inspirational kind yeah. of uh, yeah. explanation as well. And so with, within uh, Gym Active, where we, we started the, the leadership course that, that John um, created, we've been through a few cohorts now, haven't we? Yeah. John's given some examples of, of systems leadership. Can you provide some examples of having done the training and having had that experience and, you know, having had access to John as well as, as the people on the, the programme did, what kind of things have happened in GM Active since then? What, what's, you know, examples of good practice, but also kind of, um, I don't guess, what these new leaders are saying, what their experience has been, um, how has it, as we've sort of said, it's all about impacting the end user and, and you know, improving health inequalities. Yeah. What does that look like? Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's some really good examples. I think the, the the key change, what we're trying to achieve here, is different different mindsets, different thinking, different ways of thinking leads to different behaviours. Um, one of the unintended consequences that we've become very clear um, has happened is that the this is general managers pretty much that we we target, uh, you know, around that sort of level, and when they've toddled off back to their to their day jobs, then they've they found you know resistance, and that's what happens in system change. You know, it's like, okay, all right, well, you know, there's there's some, you've been in this course, these newfangled ideas. Exactly. Hey, boss, Who was it? It was delivering it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll have a word with him. Yeah. Um, but that's good. That's 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 the ripple effect. You know, the ripple effect of where this is this is happening, which is all part of system change, and so that's good. But there's some some really good examples actually where, and John will will, will know more than I do. But some of the stuff, some of the feedback we've been getting is. Some of the managers have gone back, and in, I guess in in the um, in the old way, it would be a case of, for example, in my old trust, we, we are looking at converting community rooms into more gym. You know, gyms full up, right? Then, if we we know damn well, if we put some more kit in there, pretty much that we'll we'll generate some more income from from that room than mm. than have the hassle of you know a community room that might lie empty some of the time and all the rest of it. So it's it's an easier fix. It's a more traditional fix. That's our mindset, and you know I've spent many years doing that, and you cram as much kit as, as you can into the the centres to meet the man and all the rest of it. Um, but actually, one of the managers in particular um, went off, went through the course, and and as you know, that there's a hundred day plan at the end of it, and they took one of the challenges, say, look, let's have a look at my my centre and actually do things in a different way. And throughout the course, he'd actually started to become alive to the fact that actually there's a lot more. Um, organizations that I'm a part of the system of, which I really wasn't aware of before, or vaguely might have been aware that, you know, you serve this as something to do, they have a bit to do with us around this center. But actually made, firmed up those connections, made some new ones, spoke to them about the community room, cut a long story short, ended up filling the room, making as much money as they could through putting a gym in there, but actually uh, keeping that sort of community focus mm -hmm. of that particular space, generating income in a different way, so it's still important. And equally, some of the knock-on effect from that was, I know that the balanced scorecard that was being used got adapted you know, by the whole organization. Um, and actually, the managers were tasked with just a simple thing, count how many community groups you've got using your center and be tasked with you know, more of those, please. Mm -hmm. And the correlation to the income is there as well. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you start to then have the generate, what John's done, I, mean, I think it's we're on about 80 different people now, these are all sort of not all of them. It doesn't doesn't not everybody will you know get this. It might be a little bit of a delay. Might not get it at all ever. But the vast majority do, and these have then become, if you like, part of the system. They become system disciples, if you like, and they go and actually knock on effect, change and challenge back at back at base. 
um, and, and, and so the movement grows. And that's exactly what we set out to do. Mm. Um, alongside, again, that isn't the only thing we did, as you well know, but on the pivot side of things, the whole of the workforce, virtually, not virtually, everybody, the three and a half thousand staff in GM, we have an aspiration to have them all, if you like, understanding what their role can, can be and what we'd like them to be across all of our um, 12 different organisations. We, and these are all we, we staff, not just kind of fitness and not all gym, staff across everybody. the board, everybody. Yeah, yeah. How can they have an impact if we're saying our mission and our purpose is to improve population health and address inequalities? How can they all play a part in that? And that's something that, again, we've been working on to say, we've got to scratch our brains. There is no manual to this. We're going, oh, we're making this up as we go along with some great yeah. help from Future Fit. Um, going, right, well, how do we do this? And that's where we, um, you know, are on a journey and we want to learn from others as well about how we do that. Yeah, very important. Thank you for that for both of you. But um, yeah, the learning from others is is, is very important. And, uh, and, you know, that's something that, that we're continually doing at the future fit as we as we work with different organisations to, uh, mm. to to deliver these these sort of uh, training programmes and, and, and piece of education. Um, Stuart, if I come to you from a, an awarding organisation point of view, what part do you play in this? So you are the, the, the educators in terms of, you know, you, you regulate the training providers and education providers. You kind of set the stall out really in terms of what education is available, the message that really is going out to learners, people joining the sector. Um, and I don't know about ARQ, but we have noticed certainly in the last couple of years, I would say, um, that the people who are actually coming to us to, to join the sector um, have changed um, in terms of demographics. So we did used to attract, in large part, very fit people wanting to work in a fit environment with other very fit people who wanted to be fit. Um, yeah. Now we have personal trainers and graduates who have, you know, sort of um, qualified with us coming back and saying, What's this health thing about? Mm. Tell me more about it. What's this health inequality? I want to get involved. What's this community thing? And then we also have people coming to us who are much more kind of wanting to work in um, uh, in an inclusive, accessible sector. They want to they want to be in it to make a difference. Um, and you know, I think they are sort of the leaders of tomorrow. They, they they're yeah. in that mindset, that thought process. Mm -hmm. So, what part do you play as, a, as an awarding organisation? In that, is it is it just the the qualifications qualifications and training that you you create, or you, you're a big organisation, right? You know, yeah. you can affect change. How do you how do you see your place in that? Um, it's a great question, really. I think it's one that we're still trying to figure out where where our voice can be used and where our voice can be actually best placed as well. I think when we when we look at education, we talk about the change that that Andy's talking about. I think that's going to start to take effect through education. Um, as many years ago, I think lots of people came into the sector because they enjoyed fitness and they wanted to be fit, like you say. I think that was always a traditional career path now. I think as an awarding body, I think we can really play an important part in showing that there are alternative career paths through the sector. And in order to make that a sustainable career path and look at the sustainability of the sector long term, we need to listen to the employers that we work with. We have an employer advisory board set up. We work with training providers, looking at setting a training provider board up like yourselves. And we can start to listen to the, the needs of the, the organizations. We can listen to the needs of the, um, the entities that are actually interacting with these people. And we can start to build qualifications to tackle some of these skill gaps mm -hmm. and to map a, a clear career path out as well. So traditionally, we, we obviously, uh, we write and accredit qualifications with um, different organizations. We've looked at updating gym instructor and personal training. We work with the funding organizations to make sure that that's accessible. Um, obviously, our, our last personal trainer qualification was written in 2018. Anyone that's involved in fitness or health and fitness knows how quickly the, the, the sector moves on. Mm -hmm. So I always joke saying that was out of date as soon as we accredited it. And, and I think over the last few years with COVID in particular, the, the skills that fitness professionals from instructor to managers need has, has radically changed now from um, from sort of task management back in the day where I was a duty manager, um, you know, your leadership was just your personality and some were good at it and some not, but not so good at it. Um, but you had a task list and a checklist that needed to be done every day and somewhere that would play a part into the, the GM's um, targets and achieving yeah. that kind of revenue. Nowadays, I think that the, the qualifications we need to be skilling these professionals with and starting at the very early point where, where they're entering the sector 
is that we can start to skill these people about where they sit in this bigger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We can ingrain that into the qualifications and we can start to talk about the relevant skills that are going to help them impact as much change as John was saying later on in their career. Um, you know, the, the fitness professionals that are coming in now, talking um, with lots of different training providers like yourselves, uh, looking to build packages around emotional intelligence, um, almost counseling their, their members, their personal training clients, the, the people that are coming into the door, looking at the additional services, you know, and, and that was never really in my mindset as a, as a general manager. It was very much about hitting sales targets and making sure everyone was clean. So I think as an awarding organization, through the, the input that we can have with the training providers, with the employers and the engagement, we can draw that together to impact on the qualifications that are available. We can make sure that through having those qualifications accredited and regulated, it adds credibility so that when yeah. we're knocking on the doors of the health service or you know financial management companies and saying, look, we are so much more than this and, and, it's, and it's serious, you know, we, we, can, we can regulate things as well. And I think that's where one of the successes that we really hope to see is through working in partnership with yourselves, development of the new management qualifications is that we can start to impact that change as quickly as possible. And we've been able to turn that process around reasonably quickly with yourselves as well. Fantastic. Thank you. So I think, you know, it, it's quite positive actually to hear things like, you know, you've got an employer forum and a training provider forum. And, you know, for many years, people haven't been in the same room, have they? Or mm. people have heard, you know, oh, standards, qualifications, you know, oh, that, that's not me, that's nothing to do with me. Um, but I know that in particular, your employer forum is really well attended, lots of active conversation there. And to collaborate and bring those people together who don't always get to sit in the same room together mm. is... Um, is a very positive thing. You touched on job roles there. I think yourself or John touched on job roles. Um, and that's something that I have a lot of conversations about at the moment with um, employers and with individuals um, and with other education providers sort of saying, you know, we've, we always go back to this, you know, fitness instructor, lifeguard, personal trainer. Um, but in many sort of forward thinking organisations now, they're changing these job roles. They're re redefining these job roles. And I wonder if that's something that we should be looking at as a sector um, and talking about, you know, physical activity activators or you know, social prescribers or community health champions or whatever that may be. Um, and of course, then, you know, creating the, the, the training to fit that. Is that, John, is that in, in your, you know, um, mm. in your centres? Is that something that you, because you've got so many different innovations going on, those traditional job roles don't really fit, do they? Well, it's a great and timely question, Elaine, actually. I mean, we're, we're doing a root and branch resource review here just now, trying to not to understand what, how we need to arrange ourselves now but how will we need to arrange, how will, what organisation will we be, do we aspire to be in three years time? And therefore, how do we need to arrange our resources now in order to get there? Mm. It's a tough old task, yeah. I have to say. Um, and um, there are no simple answers. There are, you know, no ready-made solutions or anything like that. There will be a bit of trial and error there. there and, and of course, it's a it's a change piece as well, isn't it? So you've mm -hmm. got to take people with you and you've got to get people to look, others to, to look at things through your, the lens that you're trying to look at things through. So we are challenging ourselves yeah. um, just now. Um, and, and I think what I would say is it's make sure you're doing it from an organisational perspective. Don't, words are cheap, aren't they? So don't just change a job title just because it sounds like it fits this new well-being world that, that we're in. Your organisation has got to change first. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the resourcing makes sense. But I think we do have to challenge ourselves. You know, what, what is it that we're trying to be? How could we best be that thing? And what skills do our workforce need? Were you going to come on there, Andy? Sorry. I was, yeah, because I, I think there's, there's things, I totally agree with, with, with all that. I do think there's, um, some clues from, from the health world if we want to work with health. So, for instance, I think every single um, fitness instructor should be called a coach mm -hmm. or something similar, um, but not just called that, as John's point. Then, then they have to coach, not mm. instruct. It's completely mm. different. Mm. Do they all understand that? Mm. What are we doing in terms of our training qualifications to enforce that uh, or get that over? Is that going to be our, our approach? I'd like to think it is. And I've been saying that for many years, to be honest. Yeah. Um, 
But also then alongside that motivational interviewing, why on earth would, would, would not every instructor stroke coach be trained in motivational interviewing? Because if we're trying to build credibility and actually be commissioned, or just if, if our approach to the way that we do our day-to-day business is through coaching because we believe it's the right thing to do, then we need to train them appropriately exactly. across the board. And, and that alone, if we did that on a national scale and shouted about it, would, wouldn't that tell you know people that we'd like to listen to us and take us a bit more seriously? Um, it, it would tell um, speak volumes. Equally, I think the Simspa question as well, which we're probably going to come on to, but the Simspa work, I've got a lot of hope in what's going on in Simspa with, with the local skills improvement projects. Um, I love their campaign, which I saw at their AGM recently about the more than, which I think really does sort of capture the fact that a position or a job role is more than it says on the tin. Um, and I think uh, we've got to do a lot more of that. I really enjoy that campaign. I think you know we should get, all get behind that in terms of our recruitment side of things, but probably come on to that. Yeah, well, we're moving on time-wise, so um, maybe we come on to that now. Maybe that's uh, that's how we summarise this discussion. Um, so you mentioned Simspa there. You know, is it Simspa's role to to really kind of take this forwards now to, to to be the leaders? Because we've been we've been to lots of different you know um, talks and discussions and talking about the pivot or not talking about the pivot, if you John. Um, <laughs> and I think we're looking, aren't we, for for somebody to, to to grab hold of this and take it forwards, we need we need the input from the award organisations, the people who make the qualifications and the training. We need the input from us as education providers. Vital to us is what employers are doing, especially employers like John, who are going right. We are reimagining our job roles. We are going to live these different titles. We're doing that as a reflection of what's going on in our community and what the needs are and what health inequalities are there and what the the local strat- government strategy is. Um, but we also, we also need, we've got the systems leadership side of things. We've got, you know, pockets of really, really good practice. But don't we need something now to, to pull all this together and, and drive it forwards? Let's summarise by what is the answer? What, how, who's going to take this forward? I, I, think, I think from, um, it's a bit of a systems leadership type response, actually, because I think everybody's got a part to play. So, you know, everybody needs, to, and, and I think those, those constituent parts are becoming quite obvious, actually. So, for me, Mike Farrar, UK Active, got a massive influence and role at, 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 a, at a national level. Um, and Mike's saying the right things. And he actually put a challenge out at the Y Sports Conference recently about is, is the sector ready, um, and particularly in workforce. And I think the resounding answer is no. So a great that we're having this discussion. So I think there's an action that leads me on to Simspa. Tara's a massive believer in this and has done some great work. So I said the, the LSIP stuff, the local skills improvement projects, the, the which is backed up by investment from Sport England mm. is great. Sport England, another another factor, they're investing heavily soon in, in various types of leadership on the back of the local delivery pilots to roll out the lessons learned from, from there, very much community engagement led type actions. So I think there's a collab, and there's others, but it's, that's a collaborative for me, this, the, the key, key areas. And I think the sector just needs to embrace it in fully mm. and not, not be um, uh, inward looking you know, we need to go, right, okay, this is what we're about. If we're all up for this, then we need to move on it and, and maybe sign something. I've put something on LinkedIn in the past about saying, make a commitment as a sector uh, that we can probably probably UK active and say, right, here you go. The, the commitment is there from the sector. Now go off and, and actually convince people, please turn to us for, you know, one national commission about something like diabetes or, or weight management or whatever it might be would actually be, a, then we'd have to deliver on it and then we could be really taken seriously as a, as part of the solution on a national scale. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Collaboration, isn't it, all the way? Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. John, your final thoughts on this? Well, I mean, that, that's that's really interesting thing. I think I, I agree with Andy. I mean, I, th- I think it's not it's no one single person or one single entity that that, that needs to grab hold of this. It, it will be a, um, a collaborative thing. And I think we have to also accept that um, the pace of things in, in different organisations will be different. Mm. And let's not try and mm. fight that. Let's just accept that that's normal, because mm. it is. So I think right the way across, whether, whether we're talking nationally, regionally, locally, in a neighbourhood, um, do something. Mm. Um, do something for the right reasons that, um, that has an effect 
in that um, in that context, and and the the notion of um, population health is affected by lots and lots of things, and have that un understanding and and try to decide the the role in which we can play with others to lift um, everybody. But I think that there are, as Andy said, uh, and I think we have to, we have to be prepared to do things differently in the way that we've done. Before mm -hmm. we've got to be prepared to be uncomfortable. We've got to be prepared to leave egos at the door. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to be prepared to be to have some humility, and we've got to be prepared to do things that we don't like doing. You know, we, we've traditionally we've not liked evidence in the things that are really important. Well, you know, health mm -hmm. lives on evidence. I'm afraid. You know, you've got to prove yeah. that this drug does 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 something, otherwise it doesn't get sold. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah. why should we be any different? Mm -hmm. Frankly. We have to be prepared, and I think if we can be prepared to evidence things and, and be able to measure through lots of different ways and, and provide raw data and qualitative insight and, and, and what have you, then we're much more likely to be believed and we're much more likely to occupy a credible space than we've than we've done before yeah thank you no absolutely fantastic point and um you know we could we may, may well do have another uh podcast purely on that purely on the data um you know how the lack of data resulted in how we were treated through the pandemic um how poor we are at gathering insight but if we did gather that insight and we could find a way and we you know whether that's through you know moving communities or that's through you know um the, the models that already exist within the NHS, you know, social values and all that kind of stuff. If we need to be able to capture that, you're right to be to be able to be taken seriously incredibly. Yeah. Um, Stu, any final thoughts on everything you've heard? I think it's been a really, uh, a really good discussion. Lots of topics. I've made lots and lots of notes to take forward. Um, and so I'll give you the, the job of the, the, the final, final thought. thought. <laughs> Don't disappoint. Um, well, I think I'm going to take a slightly opposite view. I'm going to go down into a more of a granular yeah, level. level. Um, I think that whilst all this important work is happening at the high up, mm. I think we are starting to see that paradigm shift. And I think from a, from a more granular level, the, the part that we can play as training providers, professionals, awarding bodies is, is using our voice to, to unite the masses. Because when, when the, the senior leaders come together as a sector, they need an army of professionals behind them mm. who are going to fully embrace that change. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we start to look at the, the levels of collaboration, the levels of synergy that some of the organizations have, and like you say, John, doing, doing the things that maybe have put you in an uncomfortable position in, uh, in the past of sharing your insight with a competitor, you know, we have to have the abundance mentality when we look at the health sector and, you know, together we can achieve more, we can go further and we can, we can have a louder voice. And I think, you know, when, when you start to highlight that, you know, when you start to look at the sustainability, UN goals, sustainability of the sector, quality education, health and well-being, that um, collaboration goals for good is where we come into it as the people that actually operate mm. and, yeah. and occupy that space as a sector. Mm. And I think, you know, like I say, um, awarding bodies, uh, like our employer forum, training provider forums, we can help to gain that insight. We can then start to begin to quantify some of that insight Mm. And we can almost prove what we all know is happening that maybe hasn't been quite as easily demonstrated in the past before. So I think from my point of view, my final thoughts is there's definitely a, a change in tide. And I really do hope that that raising tide lifts all boats, that as a fitness sector, we start to impact a higher percentage of the population and not just in fitness, as you were saying, mm. John, about in the additional services and additional skill sets that we can um, put out into communities. And regulate some of those qualifications to add viability and, and mm -hmm. so on to it. So thank you very much. Fantastic. That's a great final thought. <laughs> um, and I love the uh, the rising tide lifting all boats. I think that's great. And I hope that's where we've sort of left it today um, is that people watching this have taken some kind of inspiration or um, you know, from the, the great work that, you know, Andy and John have done across their organisations to sort of think, actually, yeah, if, if we were to start and think differently, if we were to start and reimagine the way that we do things, if if we had a blank piece of paper and we could start with new job roles, what might that look like in my facility or in, in my community? And maybe I will spend some time just getting a little bit more involved and thinking about what else is there outside the door of my facilities? And as, as you know, professionals, um, 
CPD training, keeping yourselves informed um, and being part of the, the conversation, as you say, and, and part of those those boats that have been lifted by the raising tide, which is uh, a lovely way to end on. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. Um, please join in the conversation with us. Feedback on our social channels, share the YouTube video, and we hope to see you again soon for some more Beyond the Talk. <laughs>